The LeBron James, Michael Jordan, GOAT debate is about to blow up in LeBron James's face. Kevin Garnett has played the steroid card. We're gonna talk about it today. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining me. Man, we got a banging show today. A really banging show. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing to GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get $240 in free bacon uh, with your order. <laughs> LeBron James is in some big trouble. Big trouble. He doesn't see it yet. His handlers are trying to put out fires. But eventually, LeBron James, his handlers, the, the, the LeBron groupies are going to have to deal with what Kevin Garnett did to LeBron James. Kevin Garnett, in a podcast interview, I think we got the clip, right? Don't we got KG? Yeah. Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce speculating about LeBron James uh, using steroids. Let's play the clip. Bron, uh, to get a uh, bucket on Bron right now? Yeah, he can get a bucket on no Bron right nope. now. Nope. Yeah, he can get a bucket. No way. Nope. Now he can get a bucket on Bron right averaging now. 25. No, I didn't say he ain't. I don't care what he's doing, but he nope. ain't sliding, playing at that she, all defensive level. 25? Like, nah, nah. Lord, 25? You still, Lord, he dunking? He's still dunking the ball with. I'm saying that Bronny can get a bucket on Bron. I'm saying he can't. One rollout, get a bucket. Three dribbles? No way. You, I'm yeah, talking about can get a bucket on. No, him. no, 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 no. Man, he, man, come on, that little dude, explosive, bro. He is, he but you Bron, seen his dad? His dad on that balco. Yeah, he, he on that new he juice. He's sliding like he used to. Man, bro. <laughs> his dad is on that balco. He's on that new juice. That there is. A lot to unpack here. I, I, I want to do it carefully. I want to do it properly. It's going to take me a little time. Uh, before I get rolling, I, I'm going to bring in a, a guy, a YouTube social media influencer named Jay Skapanak. Jay has been putting in great video work going after LeBron James. Jay is one of these people that I believe is a Kobe Bryant supporter. And, and, some, and again, if, you, if you're following things closely, the NBA conversation, there's a lot of these homemade influencers who push out a lot of content, either supporting Michael Jordan and blasting LeBron James or supporting Kobe Bryant and blasting LeBron James. And so Kevin Garnett has given them the excuse and the ammo they need to play the card they've been holding back this entire time. That many people in the sports world have been speculating about privately for a long time. That LeBron James is no different from Lance Armstrong, no different from Barry Bonds, no different from Mark Aguirre and Sammy So no different than any of the rest of these athletes that have been out chasing immortality, fame, and great wealth by any means necessary. The steroid card, the juice card, has been played on LeBron James. The media is trying to ignore it. We don't ignore anything over here at Fearless, so we're not. And so before I get too far off into the conversation, we're gonna slow it down and bring in Jay Scapatak from The Scap Attack. He's got a YouTube channel, The Scap Attack. He's on social media, The Scap Attack. That's S-K-A-P. We're gonna bring him on, we're gonna play his video, and then we're gonna dive deeper into this LeBron James, Balco, biogenic, steroid conversation, because it's a conversation sports fans have been having for a long time. Before we get to uh, uh, Skapanek, I wanna take care of, uh, you've been asking to see more from Phil Robertson and his family, and we listen. Cooking with Phil, Miss Kay, and the family has always been one of our favorite parts of the shows. And that's why we brought you more of it. It's time to go from dynasty 
to dining with the new hit show, Cooking with the Robertsons, available exclusively to Blaze TV subscribers. This show features Phil, Jace, Al, and others showing off their favorite recipes, cooking up a mess of delicious food, and dipping into godly wisdom in the way only the Robertsons can. It turns out, family, recipes, and family values really do pair well together. So grab yourself a plate and pull up a chair. Just don't forget to say grace before you dig in. This show is only available if you have a subscription to Blaze TV. So if you don't have one yet, head over to blazetv.com, use the promo code ROBERTSON30 to get $30 off your first year. But hurry, because this code won't last for long. That's blazetv.com, promo code ROBERTSON30 to get $30 off your subscription and start streaming, cooking with the Robertsons right now. The Scap Attack, next. Vince Everett Ellison, previously on Fearless. They want emasculated men. They want to say the masculinity is toxic. Well, if masculinity was toxic, my father would be poisoned because he was, he was completely masculine all the way. And he taught me and my brothers to be the exact same way. But yeah, it was that upbringing where, you know, he taught us three-part three harmony, taught us how to play our guitars. We stood in church and we sang, and church was the pinnacle to our life. I mean, the absolute center, all of it. It wasn't the preacher. It was the church itself. And I want to make this clear. There is no black church. There is no white church. There is one church, and that is the church of Jesus Christ. So I don't want to go too far in the conversation without giving credit where credit is due. Uh, you guys have heard us over the past couple of weeks talk about Scap Attack, this YouTube page, uh, this social media influencer. He's putting out great work. I see it over Twitter. And so I don't want to go very far in this LeBron conversation without giving Jay Scapanak, who's the, guy, the voice behind the Scap Attack, puts out all this great work, gives us good content to react to. We're going to bring Jay on, Scap actually, but before I do that, or before we get there, I want to play you the video he put together uh, about LeBron James. Uh, here's Scap Attack on LeBron James calling him uh, Labalco. <laughs> Play the video. Well, LeBron James continues to impress on the court in this, his 21st NBA season, while he continues to spark controversy off of it in just how exactly his body is continuing to hold up at unprecedented levels. And sure, the uh, level of defensive effort from a league-wide standpoint has lessened substantially throughout the course of LeBron's career. With nightly scoring averages in LeBron's rookie season of 2003-2004 at just 93.4 points per game, while it has risen all the way to 115.4 today, 22 full points higher. So while James's stat line from, say, his final MVP season in his aged 28 year, way back in 2013, of 26.8 points per game, 8 rebounds, and 7.3 assists, might look a lot like his line this year at nearly the age of 40, where he is posting nightly averages of 25 points, 7.9 assists, and 7.2 rebounds, rest assured these averages averages are not the same. All stats are not created equal. But even just using the cursory eye test tells us the longevity king is not aging normally with the level of athleticism and durability he is displaying at this stage and age. As James has missed only 8 of the Lakers 59 games thus far this season while playing in 34.9 minutes per game, which is roughly the same as players like 
Shay Gilgis Alexander and De'Aaron Fox, who are nearly 15 years younger. Something just isn't adding up here. And Kevin Garnett went on record recently in what he thinks might be going on. Yeah, you seen his dad? His dad on that balcony, yeah, he he on that new juice. And perhaps the most damning bit of this clip isn't that Garnett is alleging LeBron is using PEDs. It's how matter of a fact he is in making that statement. The dismissive tone as if it's virtually common knowledge. And KG, of course, is not the first to make extremely public allegations about LeBron's, uh, er, training methods. As former MMA fighter and admitted doper, Chael Sonnen also accused LeBron of not only using performance enhancers, but he went into great detail with it. If the world understood what LeBron did, we have the same drug guy, if you will. I know exactly what he's doing. EPO matters. It's the reason LeBron takes it. It, it. It's the king of performance enhancers. Yeah, that is extremely specific, and to this day, there has never been any official or unofficial response for that matter from LeBron or his camp. No denial, no legal actions, no demands for a retraction. Um, I don't believe, um, I don't want to get into a, a word, a, a word or sentence uh, feud with. Sonnen, meanwhile, has never been disciplined in any way for making these comments and is still employed by ESPN. And while Garnett is just the most recent to come with some form of accusation against LeBron specifically, he is not the first high caliber NBA player to discuss steroid use in the NBA. As way back in 2011, ESPN The Magazine did an interview with then league MVP Derrick Rose and asked him about the use of performance enhancers in the league. And while Rose did later issue a retraction through a team spokesperson, the question posed was if one equals what are PEDs and 10 equals everybody is juicing, how big of an issue is illegal enhancing in your sport? Rose's response was, quote, seven. It's huge, and I think we need to level the playing field where nobody has that advantage over the next person. Now, keep in mind the timing of that interview in 2011 and the MVP Rose won that season, as LeBron won all four of his league MVP awards in a five-year span, back-to-back -back in 2009 and 2010, then two more in 2012 and 2013. LeBron at the time, of course, had taken his talents to South Beach, and in his four-year stint in Miami, Bron's physique would see some significant changes in terms of some pretty substantial lean muscle growth. It would also be during his tenure with the Heat, coincidentally, of course, in 2013, in Miami, where the biogenesis scandal erupted, linking several Major League Baseball players to PEDs including Alex Rodriguez, Ryan Braun, and Nelson Cruz, among several others. In recently unredacted federal documents pertaining to that case, LeBron James's longtime friend and business manager Ernest Mims, as well as his former personal trainer David Alexander, were both implicated as Biogenesis clients. Alexander, by the way, wasn't only LeBron's personal trainer, he also served as LeBron's wife's trainer. So will some retraction be forthcoming by Garnett in the wake of all of the attention his comments have garnered like Rose did in 2011? Only time will tell. But as LeBron's level of durability continues to impress and more players obtain massive platforms in this social media age, it is only a matter of time before we hear more allegations that will likely come with little definitive proof, but plenty of circumstantial evidence of which there will never be any formal denial coming from the king of longevity. So <clears throat> I didn't want to steal any of that, any credit for it. And that's why we're bringing Jay on. Jay, you do amazing work. Uh, I I've been amazed, Jay, at how 
quiet the reaction has been to what Kevin Garnett has put out there. We're talking about an all-time great player, uh, a championship with the Celtics, certainly one of the 50 greatest players of all time, played at a high level during LeBron's era, uh, but the media is not reacting at all. They're trying to ignore this. Uh, Jason, first of all, thanks for having me on. Pleasure to be here. And I couldn't agree with you anymore. I mean, not only is Garnett everything that you just uh, said that he was, this is a direct competitor of LeBron's, a guy that, you know, went head to head, you know, at the peak of LeBron's power, so to speak, um, when he was down in Miami. And I, this guy is just outright dismissively suggesting that LeBron, it, it's like a foregone conclusion. Everybody knows almost that this guy is using, has been using for years, and yet where's the attention from, from all of the other major media outlets? Jay, I think what's gonna eventually be the downfall and why they won't be able to put a cap on this conversation is there are so many people, perhaps like yourself, who are uh, obsessed with the LeBron versus Michael Jordan, LeBron versus Kobe conversation, that eventually the Kobe supporters and the Michael Jordan supporters are going to play the steroid card on LeBron James. That's why I think he's not going to be able to escape this forever. I think that it's interesting. Um... Yes, there will be, uh, you know, individual contributors or people like me or yourself that are going to continue to dig into this that are not going to let it drop. But in, in my estimation, the only way that this really gets blown, that the lid gets blown off this, so to speak, is if the league or the federal government um, intervenes, which is exactly what we saw with Barry Bonds. Uh, obviously, Major League Baseball wanted nothing to do with that conversation. Um, they obviously rode Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire's coattail. Um, and, you know, the uplifting that that did to their product. But it was when the federal government intervened and kind of, you know, took on this obsession with Barry Bonds that that was what really, you know, kickstarted that conversation even more. Look, Jason, the NBA doesn't want any part of this. So we, we, we know that they're going to go to whatever um, extraordinary lengths they need to to insulate and protect their golden cash cow, LeBron James. So it's going to take some, you know, extraordinary second party. I don't know if, if I have the juice to do it, so to speak. Uh, perhaps maybe you do. Uh, and of course, the federal government does. But in today's day and age, much different time than it was. Uh, the government is a, is a different government than when Barry Bonds was playing. Does the government even have any desire to take this guy down? Jason, I think a definitive no to that one. That you, you went exactly where we needed to go with this discussion. Barry Bonds was disliked and he played a sport, baseball, that didn't have as much cultural juice as it used to. LeBron James is an important weapon and tool uh, for establishment government, uh, for the Democrat Party, and they have zero interest in seeing their icon, uh, their tool to try to persuade black voters to stay on board with the Democrat Party. They have no interest in bringing LeBron James down. I'm not, you know, LeBron has bickered back and forth with Donald Trump. I guess if Donald Trump gets reelected and we see a political change, maybe then the government would have an interest in taking a look uh, at what's going on in the NBA. F football uh, went through this and baseball went through it in terms of, you know, uh, creating a, a real hostility towards steroid use. Everybody pretends like there's no advantage for basketball players to use steroids or basketball players aren't using steroids. And that's a complete joke. Uh, of course, there's a great advantage to it. And of course, it makes sense to look at someone like LeBron James. And, 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 and <laughs> I mean, this thing's going to get so complicated because people are going to then say, well, what about Tom Brady? Tom Brady played till he was 45 and y'all never asked him if he was on steroids. You just TB12. You bought all the TB12 lies. <clears throat> anyway, unpacking, unraveling, getting to the bottom of what's going on with LeBron James uh, is going to be more politically tricky 
than bringing down Barry Bonds and baseball. Uh, you know, I absolutely and definitively agree with you. I also completely agree with your premise that, um, you know, steroid use can't be beneficial to NBA players is absolutely outrageous. LeBron James, anyone who, you know, predates his era knows that this guy's peak doesn't stack up to elite other peaks that we've seen are obviously Jordan, not even close. But even I would argue Kobe Bryant in his concurrent era, Bryant had a had a substantially higher peak as well. Really, the whole crux of LeBron's entire fabricated goat conver conversation here has been, it's been built around this longevity. So his counting stats are really the only thing that even puts him in a conversation, which myself and many others don't think that he even belongs in. But how did he get, how did he reach these longevity metrics? Right now, he is currently, he has played more minutes than anyone cumulatively in NBA history, including Kareem, when you add in playoffs and regular season. Not only has he played in all of those extra minutes, but his maintenance at the level that he's played at is at, at an extreme level. I mean, Kobe Bryant was maniacal in terms of his conditioning, his work ethic, the levels to which he went to maintain, and yet his body completely deteriorated at 37. Here LeBron James as he turned 39 two years ago, and he's still playing at a relatively high level athletically. How is he doing this? Are we to believe that he is just this genetically gifted or is he utilizing some other substances to help that maintenance? I do remember, didn't Kobe have some knee problem that he went to Germany and had some procedures done? I mean, so th there was a little gossip about Kobe. No, that was, uh, yeah, that was post uh, the 2011 series when they fell short of the three-peat, um, they came up short against the Mavericks team that went on and humiliated LeBron in the finals uh, that season when he was with his super team heat, heat squad for the first year. But correct, yeah, Kobe could, I mean, he could barely walk at the end of that series against the Mavericks. So it was at the end of that season that, yes, he went, traveled to Germany and he had, uh, I believe it was like plate platelet-rich um, enhancement yes. therapy of some sort. They they removed blood, like cycled it, and then re-injected it into the knee. It was kind of a way to avoid like a surgical um, repair on it and so that he would, you know, the recovery time might be less because he was, you know, 35 years old at the time. Well, Scap, uh, keep churning out the great content, and uh, you did a great job. We'll invite you back. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, that's Jay Scaffernan. I got a lot more to say on this, and we'll we'll get into it uh, here. And then after I unpack a little bit more, I'll bring on Steve Kim, and he'll react uh, t to this conversation. I think this conversation about LeBron and steroids is going to mushroom. We're going uh, to discuss it. Uh, it, it, it and again, it's about <laughs> this whole goat debate eventually is going to land here. This is, the, this is the tool that the Michael Jordan and the Kobe Bryant camps are going to use to discredit LeBron James. Uh, guys, uh, before I get out of here, I wanna to talk to you guys about our mission, Preborn. As we sit here today, the lives of babies still in the womb hang in the balance. I wanna to talk to you for a minute about the most important and pressing issue of our day, the lives of the unborn. They need our help. The Ministry of Preborn empowers young expected mothers in crisis to choose life. Preborn has rescued hundreds of thousands of babies' lives through ultrasounds. When a woman considering abortion visits a preborn center, she gets to hear her baby's heartbeat and meet that precious child on ultrasound. And it's a divine encounter, a life-changing encounter. The majority of the time, she will choose life for her baby. I'm proud to be affiliated with an organization that's not only working to save lives, but is succeeding. Preborn has a passion to save unborn babies from abortion and see women come to Christ. Over the past 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 450,000 women concerning abortion, and more than 200,000 of those babies have been saved. Those are amazing numbers, but let's do more. Will you help rescue babies' lives? To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash fearless. Don't go anywhere. I got more to say on LeBron James next.
and that we in 2024 are experiencing the same racism that we felt in 1924. Everybody was black, except for one seat. There were no seats, and a black lady was sitting beside that seat. Sat in that seat like this. I didn't move a muscle for three miles. I went home. I didn't tell my parents I'd sat by a black woman. And so that's our identity. And so when, when that becomes your identity, it's like what, what, when, when I was calling myself Big Sexy, I couldn't wait to go eat. And I couldn't wait to go to some pool party or strip club or Vegas party or, or, or somewhere to be around young, loose women. Okay, name, Austin Danger Fowers. Sex? Yes, please. All right, welcome back. It's good to hear from the Scap Attack, but I want to go a cut deeper into this conversation and, and take some time here to unpack this, and then Steve Kim and I will have a conversation after I go a little bit deeper into my feelings, thoughts on what's going on here. Why would Kevin Garnett do this? Why now? And, and I think a lot of it is people, jealousy, hate, I, I don't think that's it. But what people are not going to tolerate, what other athletes are not going to tolerate, is someone being placed on a pedestal when the athletes are aware of like, Hey man, I'm not sure if he deserves this pedestal. And you know, this pedestal he's placed on, hey, it works for this media personality, that media personality, and uh, Charles Barkley, and Kenny Smith, and TNT, and the guys over at ESPN, Stephen A. Smith, and who they all got to participate in it because their networks are tied into the NBA and are in business relationships with the NBA, that the LeBron James myth as the greatest player of all time, and that debate and discussion, that works for TNT, that works for ESPN, that works for Skip Bayless and Fox Sports. But uh, those athletes that have started their own podcast, they have independent wealth, they have FU money, they got more wiggle room and more freedom and whether LeBron James is seen as the greatest of all time or not doesn't mean anything to them. And so when you think about who is the greatest player who hates LeBron James and has a competition with LeBron James, it's Paul Pierce. Who is Kevin Garnett's longtime teammate and clearly close friend who they do some podcast work together with, Paul Pierce. So Paul Pierce can't take this Balco shot, but Kevin Garnett can. And so Kevin Garnett did. And a lot of former players all grew up loving and worshiping Michael Jordan. A lot of former players know it's ridiculous to try to put LeBron on the same level as Michael Jordan. A lot of former players and current players have placed Kobe Bryant on a pedestal. Kobe Bryant is like Tupac and Jimi Hendrix and Amy Winehouse. When, when, when a great star dies early or young, their star only elevates. And so in death, Kobe has become an even bigger idol. And many players have far more respect for Kobe Bryant, just as a man, as a person, than LeBron James. And just as a skilled player. LeBron James is breaking all of these records and in this position, not because of his great skill, because of his physical blessings that many of them believe have been enhanced through chemical blessings as well. But to some degree, some of this is just personal taste. Some of it is just like, man, I love Michael Jordan. Some of it is, 
I love Kobe Bryant, but there's a bit of it that is like, uh, I really don't like LeBron James. He, he, he thinks he's above all of us. The, the, the same things that irritate me about LeBron James irritate many of these players. And this whole GOAT conversation that LeBron has been engaging in and the whole universe has been debating, the whole NBA basketball world has been debating for 15 years. Some of these former players are going to call BS on it, and they're going to be backed up by people like Scap Attack and others. It's like, no, nah, LeBron ain't on Michael's level, and he's not on Kobe's level either. And then at some point, some old guys like me are going to jump out and say, I don't really think he's on Magic Johnson's level. And then the next thing you know, there's going to be some white dudes and just objective basketball people to be like, Bill Simmons may come out of the closet and be like, he ain't Larry Bird. That's where the steroid card is getting played. So a, a year ago, <clears throat> in September, ESPN uh, did a story where they tried to exonerate LeBron James from any steroid accusations or illusions. And this is about a biogenics, uh, invest, biogenesis investigation that the DEA uh, was involved in and some people got in trouble for. But ESPN got access to the DEA report, a redacted version, and wrote a story that went out of its way to exonerate LeBron James. I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from the story. Uh, but what has not been publicly known until now Found in more than 1,400 pages of unredacted federal investigative documents obtained by ESPN are the names of other athletes and figures from the world champion boxers and wrestlers to fitness gurus, entertainers, and even law enforcement officials who surfaced during the investigation of the target of the largest doping operation in U.S. sports history. Among them are former WWE star Paul the Big Show White, former boxing champion Shannon Briggs, one of the most well-known trainers of prominent athletes in David Alexander, and Ernest Randy Mims, a longtime friend and business manager of LeBron James. While reporting this story, ESPN was told by federal authorities that they found nothing to suggest that Alexander, who has trained LeBron James, or Mims, provided any PEDs to any athletes. But because both had a relationship with LeBron James, their involvement in an investigation caused investigators to look at whether James might have been involved in any activity related to PEDs. And they concluded that he was not. Quote, there was never any indication that LeBron James did anything wrong, the lead DEA investigator said. How Mims and Alexander inadvertently brought their friend's name into federal documents is a tale almost as wild as the entire South Florida investigative saga. So I'm just, <laughs> you read this ESPN story from a year, it's September of 2023. You read this story and it, it to me, what it sounds like is Jason Whitlock was seated in the living room. And in his kitchen was his brother and best friend. And there was McDonald's spread out all over the kitchen. There was filet of fish sandwiches, there was Big Macs, there were double cheeseburgers, there were french fries, there was even a, a leftover McRib sandwich. And investigators came into my house, saw me seated in the living room, saw my brother 
and one of my best friends seated in the kitchen surrounded by all of this McDonald's and the investigators came and said, there's no proof that Jason Whitlock ate any of this McDonald's. And I want you to keep in mind, let's, let's say Todd Fennell was my friend sitting with my brother. Todd probably weighs 170 pounds. My brother was seated in the kitchen as well. Let's say my brother weighs, I think, 230, 240 pounds. McDonald's everywhere. There's a 170-pound guy sitting at the kitchen, a 230-pound guy sitting in the kitchen, and then there's a 300-pound guy sitting in the living room, and all kinds of McDonald's have been eaten. But none of the investigators ex uh, suspected the guy sitting in the living room of eating any McDonald's. So Randy Mims, who I've met, he don't look nothing like LeBron James. He ain't all cut up. He, ain't, he don't look like he just stepped out of the weight room in some fitness magazine. But he's connected to biogenesis and steroids. David Alexander, the personal trainer, who's in good shape, but he don't look like LeBron. He's a personal trainer connected to steroids, but Randy Mims, uh, David Alexander, yeah, they got some kind of loose connection. But that other guy that looks like a Greek god at age 40 and 41, he got nothing to do with steroids. Not him. He's played the longest NBA career of any elite level NBA player. He looks better today than he did at age 18. His stamina and endurance is through the road. He's playing 35 minutes a game in his 21st season. That guy, investigators, they cleared him. This, I mean, <laughs> this, is, the, this is like walking in to a Brentwood mansion and OJ's hand is cut. Bloody gloves are in the driveway. There's uh, previous recordings of him beating up his wife. But you know what? He didn't have nothing to do with killing Nicole. We've exonerated him. A.C. Collins did it. <laughs> this is comical. I, if my memory's right, LeBron's wife was connected to this same personal trainer, David Alexander. But not LeBron. Oh, the guy trained LeBron a few times, but not LeBron. So I want to, people have been putting these pieces together. I want to, you guys know who Chael Sonnen is, former MMA guy, UFC guy, kind of loudmouth. He works for ESPN, white dude. He has previously, because he used to have the same trainer. Or he used to be in, in this little group, and everybody knows Chael Solon has used performance-enhancing drugs. And he has previously made statements about, like, trust me, it's like if they came and investigated my kitchen and, and, and Ronald McDonald like testified, yeah, I know Jason Whitlock. Yeah, we were very close for a lot of years. This is like Chell Sonnen is Ronald McDonald in this scenario. It's like, yeah, I know David Alexander. I know the uh, uh, biogenesis people. I, I, I know what, the, what the, all that's about. Here's what Chell Sonnen has been saying previously about LeBron James and his whole take on performance enhancing drugs. We've condensed it down, cut some chop some pieces together just to give you a taste of what Chell Sonnen has been saying about LeBron James. But they got some performance enhancers. Like, if the world understood what LeBron did, like other basketball players will hear what LeBron does and go, well, well yeah, but that doesn't matter, right? You're, it's like a baseball player and you're hitting a stick out of the way. It doesn't matter. It's like, no, no, no. If you knew what these performance enhancers did, then you would know why it does matter. What you do know, you there's, think he's there's doing? There's only one, we have, we have the same drug guy, if you will. I know exactly what he's doing. But there's only one golfer. Please tell. There's only one golfer. I'm not going to. But there's there's only one golfer that 
follows the big three. And the big three is EPO, growth hormone, testosterone. That's the Lance Armstrong diet. There's one golfer, but it's Tiger Woods. EPO matters. It's the reason LeBron takes it. It matters. Hmm. And if other basketball has understood what it do? did, EPO increases your red blood cells, which gives you endurance so you can play all game long. You can shoot in the fourth more quarter red blood just cells, like you more shot oxygen in the fourth in your red blood yes. cells. Okay, yes. got you. Got you. It, it's the king of performance enhancers. So you would prefer that, especially in a fight sport, to anything else? EPO is king. Mm. So that's Chael Sonnen, write him off. He's a blowhard. He's an MMA guy. Maybe he hates LeBron. He's just doesn't sound it to me. He just sounds like a guy that's in form and knows what athletes do uh, to make this money and to extend their careers and to play at a high level. I want to play you Kwame Brown. And another, you can write him off. Hey, he's a bust. He's this. He's that. Kwame ain't some crazed LeBron hater. He's just a honest guy, former NBA player that doesn't stick to a script. He, he's not beholden to the NBA. He doesn't have to say what TNT or ESPN or Fox Sports tells him to say. Here's Kwame Brown talking about LeBron. I know you believe in Santa Claus. I know you believe in Easter Bunny. When bunnies don't lay eggs. I know you believe in, uh, what else you believe in? The tooth fairy. I know all these things you like to believe in. But the one thing in life that's undefeated is father of time. Am I saying that LeBron did anything wrong? No. Am I saying that he does not look like any other NBA player that I've ever seen at that age? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. LeBron James does not look like any other player that I've ever seen play the game. And I stamp that. I've never seen a player that could run and jump at the level of LeBron James at 39, 40 years old. Never. I've covered sports for a long time. The, the, the only person that has played at a high level in any sport at the age that LeBron is playing at, Tom Brady. And, and Tom Brady carries himself, looks different than LeBron James, but if someone told me that Tom Brady used EPO or whatever to extend his career, I wouldn't bat an eye. Wouldn't shock me, wouldn't surprise me. It is what it is. There's too much money involved in sports for these guys to play it straight. The leagues don't want them to play it straight. The leagues don't care. They've reached a point where it's like, hey man, we're paying you enough money that if you wreck your brains, if you wreck your body, if you do anything with these drugs, we don't care. We've given you enough money so that our conscience is clean. And the athletes have accepted that deal. Sports fans seem to have accepted that deal. Most sports fans don't care. But when you just dump more and more and more and more money into anything, what you're dumping in is corruption. And the thing I don't like is just what it does to the legacies and the accomplishments of the generations that preceded these guys. And this whole myth that, oh, everything's so much better now, and these athletes are so much better than the athletes of the past, and oh, Jim Brown couldn't have played in this era, and John Elway, he couldn't have done this in this area, and Johnny Unitas couldn't have done that, and so-and-so couldn't have done this. It's all bogus. The, the, everything that I talk about on this show, about how phony, corrupt, scripted, installed, everything is. And why, and this will sound like I'm complaining, and I'm not, I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you facts. But why people like myself have to be eliminated from corporate media, and why people like Stephen A. Smith have to be installed. People who are comfortable lying, going along with the lies, promoting the lies, profiting from the lies, have to be installed to talk about these very scripted sports events. 
And, and when I say scripted, I'm not talking about like the outcomes are all scripted, but the corruption is just built in. And so you, you can't get me at some point you want to ha have an argument about is LeBron James better than Michael Jordan? Well, at some point I'm going to say, well, in this era where the players are basically have legalized steroids, how can you compare it to Michael Jordan? They don't want that conversation to happen. And so they hire people and install people and place people who will never say that. Everything you're watching on corporate television, and much of it, a great deal of it, what's popular over YouTube and over social media, it's all controlled and scripted narrative. They all know what they have to say. They all know who the untouchables are. They all go along to get along as Kwame says. And if you're not a go along to get along person, you don't fit in. And eventually they're going to remove you and replace you or install someone they absolutely control that will help them sell the lies. That, oh, LeBron James, he's the same as Michael Jordan. It's going to catch up because there are too many people just running around independently and people like Kevin Garnett who have F.U. money that eventually are going to say, I ain't going along with the script. You know what? I can say this controversial, the truth. Man, because what Kevin Garnett is saying is like, man, we had some juice that was good, but man, he on that new Balco. He on that new stuff. That's what Kevin Garnett is saying. I'm shocked amazed that all of the media is being allowed to ignore what Kevin Garnett is saying here, but I'm really not because it's a script and they're all in on it. Uh, we'll continue this conversation uh, with Steve Kim uh, just around the corner. Uh, make sure you're going to uh, fearlessarmyrollcall.com, reserve a ticket uh, for our event on Saturday, June 1st. This year's event is sponsored by our great friends at Preborn. Go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Steve Kim, next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice, no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice is rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, Humility. 
the reward for humility. And fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Cam Newton may be the only guy who ever was born who could play nearly every position in the NFL mm -hmm. at an all pro level. You sure about that? You sure about that? You sure about that? And he just happened to choose the wrong position, quarterback, because quarterback requires leadership. Remember when people used to say boss when they were describing something that was really cool? Like, those shoulder pads are really boss, man. Look at that perm. That perm is so boss. But now boss is just slang for a jerk in charge. If Cam had been a defensive end, a wide receiver, a tight end, he'd be in the Hall of Fame. He'd be Gronkowski. Hola. Mi amo Roberto. Yo soy fiesta. <laughs> it's like me trying to be a bikini model. It, it, it's just, that's not in the cards for me. There what? is nothing that enrages me more than fat models. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Uh, I can't wait to hear lifelong Lakers fan, uh, short-term LeBron hater, the Korean Cosell, Steve Kim. I want to hear his take on LeBron James, the new, uh, the Lance Armstrong of the NBA, perhaps, perhaps, according to uh, Kevin Garnett. Uh, Steve, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, what do you make of, let's start small. What do you make of Kevin Garnett even throwing these allegations out there the way that he did on a podcast kind of loosely? What do you make of that? What I make of it is very simple. As a Laker fan in recess till the departure of uh, LeBron James, he said the quiet part out loud. This is one of the worst kept secrets. If you talk to people in that industry and in that field, there's always been whispers and KG just blurted it out. Now, I think it's going to be interesting to see if anyone ever really examines this. But I do know this for people that say, well, what if what if Kevin Garnett gets sued? OK, uh, you know, the worst thing that LeBron would want in this particular situation, exposure and discovery. That process could get very ugly. And Kevin Garnett's a pretty savvy guy. I don't look at him as a dummy. He's an intelligent guy. He knows what he's doing. And I have a hard time believing that he would just say something randomly out of midair and just blurt it out for no reason. So, obviously, to me, it seems like a calculated decision. He wanted to get it out there. He didn't want to, the, the trouble of having to put it out there in a serious way. He wanted to throw this jab. Do, do you, you think it was calculated what he did, or did he just spur the moment, just kind of say it? Well, it could be a little bit of both. I, I don't know. You know, look, I'm not the producer of that show. I'm not so sure during the rundown. Okay, segment two, let's bring out the uh, HGH <laughs> allegations with LeBron. I'm not so, but I think he's had this in his mind. Look, there has been some coverage of this as minimal as it's been, and with the cover-up of the mainstream media. But we do know that business associates and his own wife were part of that biogenesis scandal. In fact, Deadspin of all uh, outlets actually wrote about it. And, you know, like I told you yesterday, Jason, if this was a guy that was not in the protected class, if he was a, let's say, a white guy that liked Trump, that has very conservative views. You know what the you, you know what the term would be used? Problematic. Uh-oh, we need to look into this. But because it's LeBron and I almost think there's almost this tacit and turn endorsement of anything that he does given the fact that much of the media today, not just the NBA or basketball, is about access, right? And being able to do one-on-ones and being friendly with Maverick Carter and that whole group. 
there's this gentleman's agreement that, hey, let's not make too much out of this or let's make nothing out of this. There's that. And there's also there's this worship like, yeah, whatever Fox came up with the show and the, the idea American Idol and let's do a TV show American Idol. That was really visionary and speaks to where the culture has gone, that America is in love with idols. And LeBron is a pretty big idol. And, and there are people that aren't in love with idols, but they're afraid of getting on the wrong side of an idol because idol worship is so high in this social media era. There's the Beyonce hive. There's, you know, the, LeBron has a hive that runs to anybody criticize him. How dare you criticize LeBron? Don't you know he gave a yeah. million dollars to a school? And my God, all the black kids he's helped and the I Promise School. And oh, you're just tearing down a black. And what about Brett Favre? And so people are just afraid of that and the, just the level of idol worship. And so what, what happened to Barry Bonds what happened to uh, Lance Armstrong in this current climate and culture, I'm not sure if those things happened the way they did years ago, the way mm, some of these high well, profile outfits. You no, know, yeah, no, yes, no. Let me go back to Barry Lamar Bonds, and I'm not a Giants fan, so I'm, 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 I'd like to think I'm fairly neutral here. Problem with Barry was he did not play the game. He was rude and he was downright disrespectful at times of the media. And also, if you took a poll of 100 teammates, I don't know how many of them really liked Barry. I think they tolerated him because he could hit 73 home runs and play gold glove uh, left field and steal some bases when he was younger. Uh, I mean, I've always said Barry Bonds is actually underrated given that there's at least two more MVPs that should be in his mantle, in his trophy case. Uh, but because he was Barry Bonds and there's almost like this Jordan effect, like we can't give it to this guy again and we don't like him. If he would have played the media game, I believe the treatment and the whole coverage would have been a little bit different. OK, now, as it relates to Lance Armstrong, that's an interesting one because he was an American idol. There's no doubt about it. He became not only just an idol. He was an icon. I still remember those bracelets, the Live Strong, those yellow ones, and th those were ubiquitous back about, what, 15, 20 years ago. I think what happened there was, though, this is where he really crossed the line, because we have to be honest about cycling. It's a level playing field. Everyone's doing it. It's the great quote from Charlie Francis that I've used before, who engineered the rise of Ben Johnson in the 88 Olympics. He said famously, it's a level playing field just not the one you think it is. So, look, Lance Armstrong wasn't the only guy doing it. I think where he crossed the line was that he lied about it, number one. But number two, he was forcing other people to retract their statements, and he was bullying other guys. And so he wasn't just a participant. He was almost like the godfather of this thing. Um, and so it's a little bit different here. But LeBron, to me, it's interesting because I don't think he's a universally beloved figure. But even with that, he is part of that protected class. He's off limits. Steve, let's go just hardcore Steve Kim, Jason Whitlock. True, you know, just who cares if the optics aren't good? Do you care whether the athletes are using steroids? I can't say that I do except in combat sports. Because you're hitting somebody. I, I, I've used this analogy before. I don't care if you run two steps faster or hit the baseball 30 feet further or you get a couple of miles or inches on your fastball. But when you are assaulting somebody and there's head trauma and you can hurt somebody really bad physically that can paralyze them or in the most gravest situation kill them. Yeah, I actually do care about combat sports. I think that's a little bit different. But when it comes to the other sports... Uh, I don't draw that hard of a line, to be honest with you. I actually thought this is going to be a very controversial statement to some people. I love the home run race of 98. I thought it revitalized the game. I thought it was the best thing for baseball at that time. And people can say, oh, my God, we were disgusted by it. 
I think that's a lie. I remember watching that 30 for 30 about four years ago about the home run race of 1998 between Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire. You can say that both guys cheated. I will not disagree with that. You could say that they cheated the game and their fellow players, I guess. Although there is this uncomfortable fact, Jason, the pitchers were using it too. But with all of that said, did baseball get back into the good graces of the American public after this strike of 1994 on those two guys' broad shoulders? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. So I do care. My position in 98, 99, 2000, and then when Barry Bonds took the record back and set a new standard, my position always was, and this is what got me and Mike Lupica crossways, is because Mike Lupica used to love to go on the sports reporters and pretend like Barry Bonds was the only guy using steroids. Yeah. Hmm. And, I, and, and, and my was just like, no, no, no. These guys are making so much money, they're all using it. And if you were in the exact same position where you could earn generational wealth, take care of your family for years after your life, you would take steroids too. And so I, I, was, I was just like, hey, let's just don't sig single out Barry Bonds or even Lance Armstrong. And I, I can remember, who was the other cyclist? Floyd Landis? Floyd am, am Landis. I right with that name? The other? Floyd, yeah, Floyd Landis. Landis. That's where me and like Mike Lupica just finally, because when the Floyd Landis thing came out, I was sitting there and everybody was like, man, Whitlock's right. It's not just Lance Armstrong. Everybody's doing it. And that irritated Lupica and these guys. And, and so if there was a, a level playing field of outrage and just an understanding, that the more money you dump in the sports, the more temptation to cheat and, and to use performance enhancing drugs, the more that's going to enter into the profession. Uh, and so let's address it from that point of view and not single out any one individual. Uh, that's where my position always was. So I am bothered by the steroid use that I think is pervasive throughout the NFL, pervasive throughout the NBA, pervasive throughout uh, Major League Baseball, hockey. I wish we could really go after it and eliminate it because it does, it diminishes the accomplishments of the guys that played before. And I know they, they in baseball, they took uppers or something, Greenies. speed or something, greenies and all that other stuff. But Jason, I do think it, yeah, go ahead. To your point about Lupica making someone the symbol or the face or the sole abuser, it was really illuminating. If you go back to that 30 for 30 on Ben Johnson, I think it was called 9.79 because that's what he ran at the Seoul Olympics in 88, where he just blew away this world-class field and pulled away from the great Carl Lewis. So they actually examined the whole thing. And there's this perception now, even to this day, that dastardly Ben Johnson cheating our great American hero and everybody else. Jason, if you watch that documentary and you can get it on the plus, because I know people that were involved, okay? Um, do you know seven out of the eight participants in that final dash or eight out of the nine were either implicated or had been suspended or busted? So let's not make it sound like this is Popeye on spinach against everyone else who's olive oil they were all kind of on the spinach except he was strongest and fastest to the finish okay so we have to be honest about these things and you're right about the accomplishments of the past this is the way i do kind of jab when it comes to lebron and and i believe in the nba the rumor is or the word that i've gotten a lot of hgh human growth hormone um when people say that lebron is better than jordan because of his longevity I always say, well, yeah, um, Jordan didn't have the help. Help. And I just leave it at that. Because if Jordan had the same type of technology, or shall I say pharmaceutical aids, I believe that he could have been just as effective, if not more, at the very same age. So, yeah, some of my Jordan bias is coming out. And you know what? I'm proud of it. I don't back down from it. Is... 
how comfortable do you feel saying that Jordan didn't have the best help that was available at that time? Hmm. I actually think he was pretty clean. That, but again, I could be completely wrong. I believe that he was probably more on cigars and bourbon than he was ever on HGH or, or, or um, synthetic steroids. That's my view of it. Now, would I be stunned if he had extra help? No, because I'm not that naive. But this whole notion that somehow the athletes are better today just because of the evolution of the athletes Look, maybe from when John uh, Bob Cousy played to now, yes, there's a steep rise in athleticism. But we're talking about the era of the mid-80s, okay? You still had guys like a young Clyde Drexler. You had guys like Michael Jordan. You still had a lot of high flyers. I mean, that's the thing that's, uh, that's really frustrating about this argument from the young NBA fans, saying that athletes are better than today by far. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't see a Sean Kemp. I don't see anyone with the athleticism at his size of Charles Barkley, who, when he was in shape, was an absolute monster. So I, I just, again, I'm, am I being the old guy telling everyone to get off the lawn? Yeah, I embrace it. I'm a curmudgeon. But I also think that I'm very, very uh, solid in my opinion, because if you look at Jordan in his last years as a broken down wizard, where he was still all-star caliber, Jason, if you look at that era of 2001 to 2003, Guess what? There was still a young Vince Carter, a young Kobe Bryant, a young Tracy McGrady. And you know what? Jordan was still putting up nights of 30, 40, and 50-point games. What's that tell you about Jordan and the rise of athleticism that I believe is a little bit of a mythology? Yeah, I don't think the athletes of today are better than the elite athletes of the past. I think there are more mediocre athletes who get to mimic great athleticism because of the prevalence of performance enhancing drugs. I think there are more small guys dunking than ever before. I think there are more guys pulling off dunks that only a handful of this really elite athletes used to be able to do, but because there's, there's so much money involved, parents, Everybody is Marv Marinovich. Every, I mean, there's not everybody, but there's a lot of parents that are Marv Marinovich that see some. I, I can, I'll never forget when I was in Kansas City. This had to be 25 years ago. I'm hosting the radio show. Uh, what was it? Morning Mayhem, Ahem Mayhem, we were doing. And some dad called in, or maybe it was the mom, I can't, called into the radio show just convinced that their five-year-old son was the next Michael Jordan and wanted to send video that they wanted me to play on the local TV stations of their five-year-old son doing all this crazy stuff on the basketball court. And I was sitting there like, hey, you know, haven't you ever heard of the kids that had hair on their chest in seventh grade oh. and were the best athletes in seventh grade? And then by the time they, they never even played varsity in high school, I go, that, that could be your son here. Well, <laughs> but, but I just think there's more young people that have been injected with all these performance enhancers. And, and, and so there are more athletic people, but it's all make-believe or synthetic well, athleticism. I, I don't, I don't know. I just, Jason, speaking of let which. me give one little final, yeah. th let me give one little final deal. S there's studies and scientists have shown that like Jesse Owens, if he ran on the tracks that are surfaces that are out today, and right. if he had the shoes that the athletes wear today, he would be competitive with Usain Bolt and everybody else. And so the technology has improved, and we look back and go, well, Jesse Owens couldn't compete against these guys today. Well, actually, yes, he could. And, and everybody's wearing better basketball shoes, everybody's playing on courts that are better, and everybody's got better drugs than they had back then. I don't think these guys are actually better than the previous uh, generations. Well, Jason, here's the thing. Speaking of these young prodigies, I just read somewhere that baby Gronk has now retired from football. And I'm thinking to myself, hold on, did he even get to seventh grade? I have to investigate that. Coach JB needs to have the father back on, by the way. Here's the thing. Um, when I watch these old, like, highlight films, 
from the 80s, especially from the 70s. And sometimes NFL films will like pan over to like the workout rooms of the New England Patriots or the Jets or the Cowboys. Literally, you have like these Nautilus machines that were like in vogue in the 70s, endorsed by Joe Weider and Monkey Bars. That's your fitness center. That is your strength and conditioning uh, epicenter for most of these teams. The other thing is, when it comes to basketball, do I believe the bigger guys are more versatile? Yes, because you have the stretch four. There's no more true post play. But the game is less physical. Jason, it's a lot easier to get to the hole and play above the rim when nobody is knocking you on your butt because they're throwing a, sh a, a Bill Lane beer. That cheap shot. I hate that. But anyway, it's a lot easier when you can do ice capades in the midair and nobody is hitting you. And look, I don't like the NBA. I'm never going to really watch it again regularly. But I am rooting like heck for Luka Doncic um, and that other white guy, the one in uh, Denver, right? Nikola Jokic. Because Jokic. You know why? I want those two doughy white guys that can't get off the floor to keep dominating. Because when you're telling me that the greats of the 70s and 80s and 90s could not play because of the athleticism, I, it breaks me up. When I, and I get sucked into these debates, and I should be better, but hey, I'm for the everyman. When I hear that Larry Bird could not play today, and I say to myself, have you seen Jokic and Doncic? Have you seen those two guys? Are we sure about that? Because Larry Bird, to me, is actually underrated. People do not, I actually think he's in my top five maybe top three, and this whole notion, well, he was slow. Folks, he was six nine and a half. He's not going to be a burner. Second of all, he didn't shoot a lot of three-pointers, and, and people point out to his percentage. The game was played differently. There is a context that has to be put into analytics and stats. The other thing is, yes, he could actually play above the rim a little bit. When he had to dunk, he would do it. He wasn't Dominique Wilkins, but he could get the ball in with authority. Also, he had a very sneaky first step. I watched a lot of Larry Bird because you had to play right up on his chest. And the thing was, he had the best ball fakes I've ever seen from a perimeter player. And I don't think people understand his size. Jason, I saw a picture of him and Magic Johnson recently, a couple years ago, standing next to each other. They were smiling. Jason, he's about two inches taller than Magic. So if Magic is 6'8", and I'm thinking to myself, like, wait a minute, Bird might have been 6'10". So the things that he did, and he was a legitimate tough guy. So Doncic and Joker, please keep dominating these soft sissies because Larry Bird needs you, and I need you. Let me make one final point that I made with our, you know, we had our guy Scap attack oh, on the show uh, before oh, you a little earlier in the oh, show yeah. uh, that I made to him that, that I want you to react to. The downfall of LeBron as it relates to this steroid rumor deal is going to be the GOAT debate. Mm. This whole thing, the, the Jordan supporters and the Kobe supporters are going to use this steroid thing to destroy LeBron James' argument that he's the GOAT of basketball. And so he, he part of his popularity, and he's leaned into it, he's the GOAT, and his whole camp has forced or helped promote that conversation. That's mm -hmm. actually going to be the thing that undoes him uh, because these Kobe groupies, these Jordan groupies, and the people that love to get in these GOAT debates are going to play the steroid card on LeBron James, and that's going to be his downfall. You know, if, if guys like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens can't even get votes for the Hall of Fame, and I believe in terms of right-handed pitching, and overall players, and especially outfielders, if Bonds can't even get a sniff, and they're not even getting to the welcome mat of Cooperstown, so they're completely out of the discussion, right? Well, if that is the standard because of uh, rumors and innuendos, keep this in mind, a lot of these guys that we are now excommunicating that we've made persona non grata, Jason, you know a lot of them never even failed a drug test? That's what people don't realize. I mean, that, that's what steroid, designer steroids were. They were undetectable. That's how Victor Conte really became this noted figure in American sports through Balco. Okay? So, yeah, if you're going to have that same standard instead of a double standard or no standard, 
yes, it is applicable. I mean, just one, one last note on Barry Bonds and how dominant he was. He's the only player I read that has had 500 home runs and 500 steals, right? You don't know no one else has done 400, 400. That's how great this guy was, but I guess he's just not a Hall of Famer, you know? It, it's it's fun. The only guy that I put on Barry Bonds' level that I, I think is underrated and deserves more conversation uh, in the GOAT debate, uh, particularly of modern Major League Baseball, uh, do you have a guess here who the card I'm going to play? You're talking modern, so does that mean post Babe Ruth? Yes. Okay, I, I tell you, a career that's actually very underrated because he missed about four and a half, five years, Ted Williams. No. Oh. No, uh, I, I, this is someone that played in the 1980s through the early 2000s that I think has a Ken case. Griffey. Of being, Ken Griffey. No, no. No. He hit leadoff. Ricky Henderson. He hit leadoff. Ricky Henderson. Hit for power, hit leadoff, stole bases. Most dangerous weapon in the history of baseball, in my opinion. That was Ricky Henderson. Who? Yes. Yes, Ricky Henderson. Uh, no, I love my, Ricky. my answer is Ricky Henderson. Yeah, right. Ricky so Henderson is what right I'm talking finally. about. Finally, we agree on something. Yeah. No, but here's Ricky Henderson could dominate a game by going one for four. That That's how great he was. And I still remember him later in his career when he would hit like 230 but still score 110 runs. Like this guy was a disruptor. He made baseball fun, um, played a pretty good left field. But, you know, going back to Ken Griffey, Jason, he was actually very clean. He was the one guy yeah. that everyone will tell you never used it. So based on the way his career turned out, maybe he should get more credit because he was above it all because he just said, you know, that's not for me. And he, and he had a he had a natural descent to the end of his career. Body got banged up in Cincinnati. Had a year in Seattle as a reunion. So if we're going to really, like, uplift guys who did it, quote, unquote, the right way, I believe Ken Griffey is actually underrated for all his greatness. Tough to get me to believe Ken Griffey's underrated because a lot of people give him his love. I, I, you're now making me go where I, I rarely go because it's been so long ago yeah. that I actually loved and followed baseball. But Ricky Henderson, when I did like baseball, I thought was the best player in baseball. Uh, but how, a leadoff hitter who three times led the league in bases on balls. That, that's amazing. Amazing. And he had lead off here, leading the league in bases on. And he would lead games off with home runs. He did that like 55, 60, 70 times. I still remember the 1989 postseason. This is when I was still watching baseball. I was an avid fan. The way he dominated that series as a member of the Oakland Athletics, he had gotten traded back from New York. And how he dominated Toronto. I mean, every game he's getting two, three, four hits, hitting for power, scoring runs, stealing bases. And then even, I remember, as I was, look, I was a Padre fan back then. In 1996, when the Padres won the National League West, he didn't hit for a high average. But every game he was scoring a run, he had over 100 runs. And he was just a great teammate. He had, he had a bunch of great stories. He never knew anyone's name except I think he remembered Tony Gwynn and everyone else was, hey, buddy, how you doing? Um, just an American. We don't have those players anymore. You know, <laughs> analytics would not allow a Ricky Henderson to play today, Jason. That's the shame about analytics. You, you would not have a Ricky. All right, Steve, I got to let you go. We, we, you got me on one today. You actually got me passionate about talking baseball and yeah. Ricky Henderson. Now, my other favorite player, I'm, I don't want you to respond because you'll go on another long story, but J.R. Richard. That was my – J.R. Richard, Tragic. six foot Tragic. eight. He, big, he was the big, heavy set version of Randy Johnson. Lord have mercy, man. His fast. Yeah, I'll leave you anyway, with this in your audience. You got to go. I just want to, yeah. February 28th, let it be known to the Fearless and Blaze Network. This will be the last time me and Jason talk baseball all year. So there you go. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're going to move on from Steve and uh, do a little Tennessee harmony uh, with Virgil and Anthony. We're going to talk about reparations. Virgil's written a long piece about reparations, and part of his take is from a biblical perspective. 
Uh, we'll do that when we come back next. Vince Everett Ellison, previously on Fearless. Another thing about King, a lot of people don't know. Uh, Margaret Sanger, as you know, Jason, started Planned Parenthood. Uh, you know, she had the Negro Project as a side project called Black People Human Weeds. And that her, 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 that her, her plan was to exterminate the whole black race. Well, guess who was the first recipient of the Margaret Sanger Award? Martin Luther King Jr., 1966. Yeah, he was having Margaret Sanger set up abortion clinics in the black community to a point where Margaret Sanger gave him an award. And when people say, well, King didn't know what was going to happen, da 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 da, da. I said, it was very funny that his family never gave the award back. They still have it. They're still proud of it. Martin Luther King Jr. was a, was a man behind that, was behind the uh, man out clause in welfare. People say it's LBJ. No. All right, welcome back. Time for a little Tennessee Harmony. Uh, Anthony and Virgil Walker, uh, brothers in Christ, are uh, here with me as normal on Wednesday. Anthony, if you could start us off with a prayer. Father God, we thank you for uh, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. We owed a debt that we could not pay, and Jesus bore it all. We thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so Virgil has written a column that will be the uh, substance or the topic of our conversation today. Virgil's written a column about a controversial political issue, reparations. Uh, reparations is owed to uh, descendants of slaves. Uh, I've read the article, Anthony's read the article. I'm gonna have uh, Virgil uh, start us off with a summary uh, of what he wrote and, and unpack all of it in a condensed for, uh, portion, but then spend maybe a little extra time at the end, Virgil, unpacking your thoughts on it from a biblical perspective, which you got to about 60, 70 percent of the way through the article. But anyway, Virgil, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. I, I really was excited to, to, to write this piece. In fact, what reminded me uh, about my desire to write it was uh, you had uh, Vince Ellison uh, on a, a few weeks ago, and just that interview all together made me think I've got to re I got to revisit this particular subject. And so, as it pertains to reparations and this election cycle that we're uh, involved in, I thought it would be important from a Christian perspective to think through this, and rather than operating from a, an emotional standpoint, to operate from a a, a more biblical one. But I, laying out the case took a while. You mentioned it. Uh, at the top, it took a, a minute, but the, the key points uh, are, are these, that, that reparations is really not about rectifying past obstacles or past grievances. Uh, it's really more about uh, taking power out of the hands of a few and putting it, or the hands of the many rather, and putting it in the hands uh, of a few. And the thesis basically is that the, that the federal government uh, has actually made great efforts uh, to try to rectify the debt that's owed due to slavery. There's no way to, from a monetary standpoint to absolutely rectify it. But my argument is that more than any other nation on the earth and in the history of the world, the United States government has done more to, do, to rectify that wrong than anyone else has. And so as it pertains to uh, the ledger, if you will, of what America owes to the descendants of black slaves, uh, I, I, my argument is that, that the ledger should read paid in full. Uh, I know that's a, a challenging statement, especially on an emotional topic, but I look at a number of different issues re related to it. One is uh, that that uh, when I think about the Civil War, what it took for us to leave uh, or to, to be emancipated, uh, there were some 362,000 um, uh, Union soldiers who actually lost their lives in the emancipation uh, of the slaves. Uh, furthermore, after slavery, you hear about the 40 acres and a mule, uh, and that was a false promise. We could talk about that uh, at, a, at a deeper level. Um, the government enacted uh, the Southern 
Homeland Act uh, of 1866. And when they did, there were some 46 million acres of land uh, that were set aside. These are lands in Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Florida. Uh, there were about 6,000 Black men who took advantage of uh, that land, not all by any means, but and there's, there, was a, there were a number of reasons why that didn't take place. Even in the 1800s, you had the, the Civil Rights Act of 1870, 1871, and 1875. And all of these were issues to address discrimination. Uh, they were to address uh, what people were dealing with from the Ku Klux Klan, uh, as well as, in, as enforce voting rights uh, to Black Americans. And so from, from there, you've got uh, the, the fact that, uh, that, that be, between the land, uh, between the blood that was, that was, that was a given, and then when I looked at the kind of our, our modern history, uh, historical narrative, you've got somewhere in the neighborhood of about $22 trillion that have been spent since 1965 uh, in Lyndon B. Johnson's war on poverty. Now, while this was not a direct target to black people, uh, it was something that was aimed primarily at the poor. Uh, and of those, th the vast majority of blacks benefited from that. So again, when I look at uh, the the war on poverty, twenty two trillion dollars spent there. When I look at the civil rights movement, what what the benefits from there? The civil rights acts that were done in the in the eighteen hundreds, the, the late eighteen hundreds. Uh, when I look at the three hundred and sixty plus thousand uh, Union soldiers who lost their lives, again countrywide it was six hundred and twenty thousand. But but of the of the three hundred and so that three hundred thousand or so that lost their lives on on Union uh, on the soil uh, that were that were Union soldiers. When you look at that in composite again, I go back to no other nation in the history of the world has done more to right the wrongs of slavery. I, I want to say this before I, before I end, and I'm open to any questions that that you guys might raise regarding the piece. Um, slavery is an injustice that is difficult a to quantify and B, to properly rectify. Uh, I, I think we would be foolish not to absolutely uh, admit that, acknowledge that, and realize that. Um, when it comes to righting that kind of wrong, I'm not sure that there's any uh, tangible payment that could be provided that, that would absolutely fix uh, the emotional uh, baggage that, that comes with that. But again, I still go back to what I said, more than any other country in the world uh, in the history of the world, the United States has done more to try to rectify that wrong uh, than anyone else has. So that that's really that's really the basis of of the of the piece and the argument. At the end, Virgil, and j j you argue things from a more biblical perspective. Right. Where do you land on how God or how the Bible stands on reparations owing yeah. a debt to descendants of people that suffered. Where, where do you think the Bible stands on that? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And at the end of the day, I had to lay out all of this history, historical narrative, only to come to that end. And, and the reason I did that was for a very, very real purpose. One is that uh, I start out when I, when I make the argument there that, that all of us are indeed uh, sinners uh, who owe uh, God a, a, a reparation, who owe God uh, uh, his recompense for, for, our, for our sin against him. All of us are sinners falling short of God's glory. We could not repay God for our sin against him. So in his grace and mercy, he sends his one and only son as, a, as an ultimate sacrifice uh, on our behalf. Um, we who uh, repent of our sin, our, place our full faith in him, experience eternal life. Uh, God's not after reparation. We can't fix that. We can't repair that. Uh, he, he gave his son and, and demonstrated for us the manner in which we should engage one another. S scripture is clear that, that, to, that to whom much is given, much is required. We have to re recognize we've been given much in the way of God's grace. Uh, and as a result, we need to give grace to others being forgiving. In fact, at the end of the piece, I kind of walk through the parable uh, of the of the unjust servant, sometimes uh, ca called you know called the parable uh, of, of the of the unrighteous servant, and, and basically it's a parable that that uh, that Jesus actually tells about a man who uh, who was a servant who owed his master a great sum of money. Uh, he begs his master not to put he and his family in prison, uh, and as a result, the master says, uh, "Okay, I hear you. I'll forgive you the debt completely." 
This servant then turns uh, to uh, uh, someone who owes him much less money. Uh, and 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 when that when that person says, I, I beg of you, don't let my, my you know put my family in prison, he ends up putting him in prison and saying, you're going to wait there until you pay all that you owe. Well, when others heard of the story of what the servant had done, they told the master. The master grabs this servant who who owed money, whose money whose debt was forgiven, and he says to him, "How how wicked are you that I forgave you this massive debt, and you were unwilling to forgive someone else a smaller debt?" That was owed to you. My argument there is we owe a massive debt to God um, that we could not pay. Uh, When we look at the relationships that we have one with another, we have to demonstrate an ability to forgive. Uh, Furthermore, the the, the text of Scripture goes on to uh, where where Jesus says, if if you're not able to forgive your brother, uh, this is the manner in which you will be dealt with uh, at, at the end of all things, when when uh, when, when you're trying to enter uh, the kingdom of God, and so I, I lay all of this out in the piece. I think these are sobering words. These are sobering thoughts. It's things that we need to think about as we as we engage in this conversation. I, I would go further to argue that that most of those who are living today never never uh, uh, had the impact. Of, uh, of slavery, uh, definitely not directly. Uh, and so th- they, they definitely aren't the ones owed a debt. Uh, and, and that what we've experienced in our time here in America has been such uh, that we could overcome poverty unlike any other place that we could have been, uh, that, that we could have landed in, in the world. And so it's with that in mind uh, that we, we should operate from a position of forgiveness. Uh, we need to operate from a position of grace uh, and not allow others to manipulate our thoughts uh, as it relates to reparations, because at the end of the day, all the whole argument around reparations uh, is is really a, a political one uh, for power, uh, and it's used as a lever to manipulate us more than it is uh, something substantive that will really ha- that will really happen in our lifetime. Anthony, mm. he as I said, I, I love the article, love the case that Virgil lays out. He does an excellent job from a historical space. He even deals with a good deal of the slavery, you know, helping to differentiate chattel slavery as practiced by uh, so many and and what the Bible slavery was in scripture, how those are different. He talks about that very well. Um, I think there is a case um, for reparations generally and not from a we're looking for a check today, but from the general practice of hey, I'm making a reparative action because of a wrong that I've done to you. Um, that's, there's an argument that can be made there. The problem is, and, and this is one that Virgil and I talked about a little while ago, Jesus says, you know, if you have an ought with your brother um, before you come to worship God, settle that quickly. Yeah. He literally used the term settle it quickly because what happens is if we don't take care of that quickly, You'll have time and anything could happen generations down the line. And that's where we are now. There were efforts, you know, way back in the 1800s. He listed some of those efforts. Uh, There was actually some reparations that were paid to slave owners Uh, in 1862. It was the Compensation Act uh, because they uh, felt like, hey, well, the government is making us emancipate these slaves. That was property of ours. We're losing property. We need some kind of reparation for that. So there was a time where, okay. We're cutting checks. And, and I think the whole effort of, you know, 40 acres and a mule was that. I think if there was a monetary check cut at the time, I think, yeah, that, that's, that would be right as a repair. The problem is where Virgil and I do agree. The problem is that now reparations is not so much of a trying to right a wrong as it is trying to suggest that this monetary amount is a solution to all of these political and social problems. That's not the case. And, and at this point, you know, you couldn't really figure out how to disseminate a check, who's going to get one and all that. It, it's, it's not even there. So I don't think that that's going to happen. I'm not looking to the government and wouldn't advise anybody else to look to the government to cut you a check because you're a black person. And, you know, some of your some of your ancestors may have um, suffered say, slavery here in America. So one of the thoughts, and Virgil, I'm going to circle back and ask you something specific about your article, but one of the thoughts where this conversation leads me and just thinking about reparations, where it leads me is 
there's a story, and I can't tell it right now at the top of my head because I'm just thinking of it in real time, but about so, someone drowning in the ocean and a boat comes by and, mm-hmm. and something else mm-hmm. comes by mm-hmm. and you just mm-hmm. kind of pass it on. Yep. And then they die and they get there. What oh, happened? I sent you a boat. I sent you yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And so that's part of where my mind goes in terms of in 1964 and 65, Lyndon Johnson and the government, along with the Civil Rights Act they passed, they recognized, and this guy, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who worked for Lyndon Johnson, they recognized like, man, we got to do something for black people and the black family. And the Moynihan report came out and he suggested that the government should do everything to restore the black man to where he could take care of his family and be the head of his family. And the Moynihan Report, and and there was great enthusiasm for it. And then a different group, just speaking factually, uh, black academic elites and the media, the corporate media, frame that as racism. Uh-huh. Oh, my, you're going to invest in the black man and the black fathers and restore the black family. And then that's what made them pivot to the Great Society Initiative and what many people believe is matriarchy. No, we're going to invest in the matriarchy and we're going to make sure that uh, the natural family isn't necessary anymore because the government's going to send a check and blah, blah, blah. And so I sit there and go, Man, a boat came by to save us and was going to restore and empower the black man and make him the head of his family. And a group of oh, satanic people said, no, 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 no. Don't put the man in a leadership position. Don't restore the black family, blah, blah. And we went for it. And that was, and so I sit here as an adult and maybe feeling sorry for myself, but I talk about it on the show. Like, when I sit and think like, man, how did I get here? 56, I ain't got no kids. And I think about those boats that God sent, God sent me. Mm-hmm. I can now see like, man, mm-hmm. this dude sent me luxury cruise line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I blew it. I made really stupid choices. Mm. Based on, and then so, do I still, am I owed something? Or, or do I have to live with the consequences of my choices? So you're, you're like you're like Virgil uh, when we were talking earlier, those acts and actions. Yeah, they they were restorative. I as I told him, I think that if it were framed as, hey, y'all, let me tell you what this is. This is our reparations act. OK, I think it would have been received differently. Absolutely. There was a lot of things done. One analogy I gave to Virgil is, you know, you do your wife wrong or something. And you come home and bring flowers and you bring chocolates and you buy her some new shoes, et cetera. That doesn't go in the house. You got to say, hey, honey, I'm sorry. I messed up. Now, all of that stuff is good. But until we address this. So I'm saying from a standpoint of, hey, these things that we're doing, this specifically is the reason why I think that would have been received differently. Yeah, I I, I don't disagree. My challenge to that, my only challenge to that is this. You've got to think about the the situation that the country was in. You had a civil war that had taken place. North and South are separated. One of the things that Lincoln did was, in an effort to bring the country back together, uh, he he had a he, he he had a vice president who was a Democrat. I mean, you, you know, you usually have your your party, same ticket, whole thing, but but Lincoln has a Democrat who's now his vice president in his second term. Lincoln gets assassinated, and so the this Democrat. Uh, who was, uh, you know, a, 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 an advocate of the of the South, uh, really nullified uh, forty acres and a mule. I mean, that's what that's what actually happened. Yeah. Uh, the, the promise uh, yep. was a was a promise from a from a uh, a Union general, General Sherman. It was it was called the it was called it was a special order. It's, some some called it the Sherman Act. It was a special order where they had gone in. They the Union had gone in and taken and and captured all of this Confederate land. And we're, we're going to hand it over to the slaves. That was the, the, the opportunity when all the slaves gathered. There was the 40 acre and a mule promise. Uh, and, and Lincoln signed off on it. Only to then have, once Lincoln was shot, this Democrat take the presidency and says, no, 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 no. 
y'all y'all are not getting that. What's ironic about that is blacks vote Democrat. Like that that's the craziest part. Like the the whole forty acre and a mule thing was taken away from you from Democrats, and here we are voting de- you know for, for 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 Democrats. But but needless to say, that was in place at the time. Uh, you know, there were some 46,000, or I'm sorry, 460,000 acres of land that were confiscated that were going to be get, given over. Now, when that didn't happen, that's when you had uh, the Southern Homestead Act. Uh, now, mm-hmm. now realize the country is trying to be put back together. So these were slave states. You had the North and the battle was about slavery. Right. Uh, and, and, and the union of the of the country. It would be difficult. It would be kind of throwing it in the in, in the face of the of the of the South. And there might be some black folks who say they should have thrown it in the face of the South, that this was for slavery, that this was for reparations. And you, you could have that argument. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to bring everyone back together, black, white, north, south, for you to lay out this is this is reparations for black people in in kind of in your face while they're living in the south and they are the majority and the, and the vast you know majority of the areas where they are that would have been a difficult thing so in ret- i mean i think it's easy where we live at this time to say what they should have done was said this is indeed for reparations and i, I you know i wouldn't have a problem with that but at the same time i've got to recognize the time that they were in was one where they couldn't lay it out like that, but instead, what they did was they 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 gave us you know thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth amendments, right? We're we're now we're now citizens. There can't be slavery, and now we can vote. And again, that had all kinds of problems with it. But at the end of the day, they, they're they're saying, okay, here's land, and the land for the first time in the history of the United States did not exclude black people from having access to it. It was available. We didn't take advantage of it. And and if you read other other uh, historic accounts um, like Booker T. Washington. Virgil, pro- I want to throw in one other thing before I forget it. It, it just, and, and obviously any country's history is rich and nuanced and far more complicated than is presented in short conversations like mm-hmm. this or even in studies of books. But I, I did want to throw, because the Andrew Johnson thing is very important and it's almost never talked about. And so I I just want to throw in this. Andrew Johnson's descendants live here in the Nashville area. Uh, I'm friends with uh, (laughs) one of his direct descendants. Andrew Johnson's history is not talked about, disclosed, but there are people that have written books and have done the research. Andrew Johnson, there's a pretty compelling case that he participated in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and that John Wilkes Booth did not die in some barnstorm or whatever. He was taken care of by Andrew Johnson after Mm. the assassination. And, And I got into a long conversation last summer about this with someone who knows the history, conversation with someone in Andrew Johnson's family, and, and all of that. And so all of these things that we think are very simplistic and, you know, we're owed this and 40 acres and a mule. And, and much of the conversation isn't being driven by people with a sincere desire to get at the truth. They're trying to be politically expedient and they're trying to gain power. And that's what I thought mm-hmm. was interesting in your piece, Anthony, I mean, Virgil, is you identified the group that's the leader of the reparations movement who want to actually control the funds Mm -hmm. that are gotten from reparations. The people leading the fight for reparations don't want Anthony Virgil, Jason Whitlock, or any black individual to get this money. They want to oversee it and pass it. Anyway, talk a little bit about that and then we gotta move close to wrapping up. Yeah, no, the, it, it's the National African American Reparations Commission. Uh, they are, they're the leading voice right now for the, the, uh, the reparations conversation argument, what have you. Uh, they're the ones in Washington. They're the ones creating all of the, 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 the legislation and, and, and challenging uh, you know, thinkers, leaders, and those in Congress where all the purse strings are. And what they've basically said, not only have they laid out uh, the amounts of money that are just unbelievable, uh, I mean, we couldn't even we couldn't pay we couldn't pay it if we sold everything we 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 ever we ever had in the United States. That said, they don't want these. They said very explicitly they do not want 
individualized checks going out to black folks. And if anyone argues that there should be individualized checks, it's because they suffer from some form of, of, of whiteness that, that needs to be repented of. I mean, it's kind of that, that kind of language in, in the quote that they, that, they, that, they, that they lay out. What's crazy about that is they want a, 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 f- a financial monetary repository where all the funds can be put into. And then they want to have a, 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 an organization oversee uh, this money, primarily their friends and family, who will oversee the money and determine what is fair for some to get rather than others. And so even those, even those who are on the front lines of this conversation, those who are in the places and spaces to move the levers of power, they don't want you to have a reparations check. They want you to be angry about the fact that you don't have one. But as soon as one gets cut, they're going to ensure that it does not come to you, but that it comes to them for them to dole out to those they need. It's a, cause I'm not against reparations, but I don't trust any of the movements for reparations. I don't believe cutting individuals or some group a check is the right way to do it. I'm, I wanna go back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan and the Moynihan Report, and I want to invest in men and family. Mm. And so literally, like the kind of ideas that would excite me if they were talking about reparations, and, and Anthony, I would think you'll love this idea, <laughs> but I would be cutting checks to churches. I hear you. Who execute marriages. And then the longer, th- each year that that marriage, that new marriage that they produce at their church, each year, that it survives. Yeah. You cut another check to that church. All right. Then you cut another check. And turn the churches, black churches in particular, into marriage factories. And then incentivize those people in those marriages to stay married. Incentivize that church to do everything to break their back to make sure they stay married. Wow. That restore the family and then look up in a generation and see all the goods you've created rather than getting somebody to check and everybody heads to the Essence Festival in brand new <laughs> Louboutin shoes or whatever, you know, whatever is fashionable. J- uh, Jason, but, Jason, the only the only yeah. problem I see with that is the only problem I see with that is Mike Todd then gets some some checks coming to his church. That's the only problem I see to that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll deal with the consequences of some married folks that are hyper incentivized to stay married. Ooh. Things will come from that, uh, I, I believe. Wow. And, and because, because here's what both of y'all know. Marriages will not survive without a strong relationship with God and the church. Amen. They Amen. will not survive. Amen. Uh, and, and, and I know there's a lot of secular people. Man, I've been into 25 years mm-hmm. marriage. Mm-hmm. Are you really happy? As, you know, there, there's a lot more yeah. to a marriage surviving. Yeah. Uh, and And... And, but anyway. The Whitlock Marriage Act. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for Who it. Can lose? <laughs> Trust. The collateral damage, then there'll be some mistakes made, but overall, when we look back at the fruit that that would bear, I'm Lord with it. Have mercy. I'm uh, with it. So, anyway, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for the conversation. Uh, we'll cue up some harm. You know what? Before, before I go, I just I want to give Anthony a final. Uh, sports little thing. I, I can't have the LeBron conversation we've had all day <laughs> without hearing. Uh, Anthony, what did you think about Kevin Garnett uh, suggesting LeBron was on steroids? I think it was tongue-in-cheek, really. Because, I mean, the story's been out there, but I think it was tongue-in-cheek. But I don't need, I don't need the steroid talk to put LeBron under Michael Jordan. His career has already Kobe done. He's, he's not in the discussion of Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. LeBron. LeBron James is not. He's had a great career. He's got a lot of stats. Um, He's done a lot of things in the game of basketball that has been great. I can't knock his career. But as far as what Michael and Kobe did, respectively, and that's that's without the steroid talk. You put the steroid talk in there, then we're having a whole different discussion. All right. Uh, Virgil, did did I hear you trying to say something? No, I just I just said I I I agree. It's uh, it's they're not. He said everything I would have said, so. (laughs) Perfect. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. Cue up some harmony. We'll see you tomorrow.
up so divided Stop fighting in the sand tall. We used to be a nation, one united Now we're headed for a downfall Gotta let your light shine down What we need more than anything Open up your eyes and- 